Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Dan Diamond, a national health reporter at The Post. And today we're talking about the ongoing global fight against the coronavirus pandemic. My guest is Jose Manuel Barroso. He's the former prime minister of Portugal and president of the European Commission. He's now board chair of the global vaccine alliance known as Gavi. Professor Barroso, welcome back to Washington Post Live. A pleasure to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. You come at a critical time. Coronavirus cases have been rising around the world, including breakthrough infections. The Omicron variant is being detected in more and more countries, including your native Portugal, and breaking as we speak here in the United States. What is your level of concern, Professor, about this new variant and the rising number of cases? Oh, we are concerned. Uh, we can all only follow what the health, let's say, experts and uh, um, immunologists are telling us uh, what we know so far is that this variant is more transmissible than previous ones. Uh, we don't know yet enough about this new variant. There are uh, studies going on. Of course, we need more time, we need more data. But of course, the first news uh, received confirmed that there should be concern. And that's exactly why the WHO has, has uh, designated this new variant as a variant of concern. The U.S. and other wealthy nations are imposing travel bans, other restrictions. Do you think those measures are reacting or appropriate reactions or are they unwarranted? Are they overreactions? Uh, it's a principle of prudence. Of course, at the end of the day, it's a matter of judgment. Uh, I believe that uh, what we should have done was before. Uh, as you know, for a long time, we and others have been saying that no one is safe until everyone is safe. And this was not just a slogan, because we said, and uh, very, very often, that the longer we take fighting this pandemic, the more likely will be new variants, potentially more transmissible and even more dangerous. And that's exactly what happened. Africa is less vaccinated than, let's say, Europe or the United States. And now we are seeing a new variant. So I think uh, there was not sufficient commitment not sufficient preparement, uh, prepara preparation before. Now, uh, we don't know yet exactly uh, the effects of this new variant. So it's a measure of prudence that some governments are taking. Some, it's a matter of national policy, depends on different countries, on the connections they have also with the sources of uh, origin of that, uh, that virus. What I believe is that uh, we should continue to observe all the standard measures of prevention from using masks, from social distance to take all these kind of measures. This is the right thing to do. And of course, to increase the levels of vaccination because vaccination remains the best protection you can have against this uh, virus, whatever variant we are speaking about. Understanding that mistakes were made and preparations could be better, just staying focused right now on next steps. You were Prime Minister of Portugal, President of the European Commission. If you were in one of those roles, given what we know right now, would you push for travel restrictions? Would you put any new protections into place to protect your people? The new protections, yes, not completely uh, blocking the travel. I think it's probably not necessary. With, uh, with vaccination and with tests, PCR tests, as that's what most European countries are doing, uh, I think uh, we should continue to have free travel. Provided, of course, the travelers show that they are vaccinated and that they have made a recent PCR test and that they are not infected. I think, uh, uh, as always, something as a balance is required, not to go for panic, but also not to pretend that nothing is happening because we have a new variant that is more transmissible than the previous ones. One more quick Omicron question. Your board chair of a global vaccine alliance how much will we have to change our strategies, Professor, if it turns out that Omicron is challenging the current efficacy of vaccines and other treatments? We were just now, today I was in the first day of uh, the board meeting of, of Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines. And in fact, what we are discussing also with our partners, the countries themselves, but also the other agencies, is to speed up all the efforts. We need to go further and quicker with vaccination efforts. Uh, uh, I believe that uh, this um, inequity that we still see today in distribution of vaccines 
it's not only morally wrong, because it's wrong from an ethical point of view, but also it's uh, um, not good for the more developed world, let's say like that, because the risks I've mentioned before will increase with the, the delays in vaccination all over the world. You just mentioned the inequities that you're seeing around the world with the global vaccine effort. That global effort has become more urgent with the emergence of a new variant, Omicron. What is your sense of the state of the global vaccine effort? I mean, I think there were good things and things that were not good, to be very frank. The good things was science. Uh, we developed uh, new vaccines in record time, unprecedented. In less than 10 months, we had new vaccines. So science has been doing a great job. Politics has not been doing a great job, let's be honest about it. The reality is that our governments in general, even the governments of the more developed and powerful countries in the world, were not prepared for this kind of pandemic. So they were not prepared. They had no ventilators. They had no protocols of action. They were, um, they were sometimes not the most basic material like personal protective equipment. So many of our national health systems were near a collapse. Uh, breakdown. So I think it's very important that political leaders draw all the lessons from this because politics fail. Science, no. Science has been giving a contribution. Now, in terms of distribution, also, we are behind uh, our goals uh, because what happened was export restrictions, stockpiling, excessive stockpiling of doses by some of the more developed countries, lack of transparency from some manufacturers. There were problems also of production in terms of scale up of production and some ruptures in the uh, supply chains. So many problems uh, in the implementation and that make the situation now uh, unfair because uh, the last figures I have show that 54%, more than 54% of the world population has taken at least one dose but only 5.8%, 5.8% only of the low-income countries have had at least one dose. So you see the difference. And if you compare the richer countries, the more developed countries, for instance, in Europe, there are uh, around 80% of, of, of vaccinated people with two doses, while low-income countries uh, at 5.8%, only one dose. So this is, uh, of course, uh, not good. And this shows that there has been bad behavior from some of the players uh, in the system. You know, using your hands to measure the amount of vaccination gives me a sense of what your teaching style must be like, Professor. So you have mentioned not just the disparities between the West and, and the more developing countries, but also that this is more than just supply, right? That there is a challenge with infrastructure at the end of the day, getting shots into arms. My colleagues at The Post Yasmin Abudaleb, Leslie Roden just wrote on how South Africa has turned away some doses because they were going to waste. What is being done to make sure that supply isn't just waiting at the airport, that it's actually getting into arms? Has Gabi done enough to make that happen? We are doing that with our partners because Gavi is not, uh, Gavi is basically focused on, let's say, the procurement of vaccines and also in some other steps of the this process, but afterwards, it's the responsibility of the national health systems to distribute the vaccines nationally, sometimes with the help of agencies like the WHO or UNICEF, or even sometimes civil society organizations. And there, in a more granular analysis, yes, we see that to a large extent, some governments, some countries had not sufficient resilience in their health systems. And also we see uh, that there is uh, there are some cases of vaccine hesitancy. There were some bad decisions, for instance, rejecting vaccines that were perfectly acceptable. Uh, I can tell you some cases. For instance, the same vaccines that we took here in Europe, uh, they were rejected in some African countries because they were creating some fears about it. And so we had to afterwards to redeploy those vaccines for the other countries that were ready to accept the same vaccine. Mm -hmm. So it's very complex, you know, you, and we cannot make uh, speedy generalizations. For instance, Africa, there are countries that are doing relatively well, others who are doing not well at all. In Asia also, there are huge differences. So we have in a more granular analysis, we see 
that it depends also on the absorptive capacity of each country. And this is precisely what we are now focusing, because at, during some time, our most important problem was that we had no vaccines. We had simply no, not enough doses for the reasons I already mentioned, export restrictions, excessive stockpiling and so on. Now we are coming to a new phase where hopefully we'll have vaccines because there is a ramp up, there is a surge of the uh, production of vaccines, but we are not yet sure that we are going to be able to uh, effectively uh, deliver them so they are going to reach the people that uh, we need to reach, precisely because I, of these, let's say, absorptive capacity problems. I, I'd like to talk more about that strategy, but first, I want to take an audience question that gets to some of the issues you've mentioned, specifically with wealthy nations. This comes from Mitchell Kent in Virginia, and I'm going to read it for those who might not see the screen. Does authorizing booster shots in the United States affect the global vaccine effort by diminishing the supply to the global south? Professor, your opinion. A good question. The point is the following. Of course, with the same quantity, uh, if you have more for boosters, you have less for the rest. But uh, I don't think we can say that because what we are seeing is an increase in production. So hopefully, there will be enough doses for boosters in the countries that want to go for the boosters. And now most countries, for instance, in Europe and in Northern Hemisphere want to go for boosters, there will be enough doses for boosters, but also for delivery in the so-called global south in the developing countries. Gavi helped set up COVAX. We haven't specifically talked about it yet, but COVAX, it's a global alliance intended to provide equitable access to vaccines, rich country, poor country, no matter where you live. Has Omicron changed the COVAX strategy at all, Professor? No, we are, except to the, the sense of urgency that I mentioned before. Uh, COVAX, as you said, it was created at the initiative of Gavi, Global Alliance for Vaccines, but also CEPI, it's another organization, by the way, based in the United States, and the WHO, and also with the cooperation of uh, uh, UNICEF. And the idea was precisely to have a global mechanism, a truly multilateral mechanism, so that we could negotiate with manufacturers and provide vaccines um, to the world in general. But of course, since the richer countries were able themselves to enter in direct contact and in good contracts with manufacturers, we have been focusing our efforts in the developing world, in the poorest countries, in the low-income countries. And in many of those countries, we supply 40 to 80 percent of all vaccines they receive. So uh, it's very important. We are performing a very important role. But uh, what we need more is, of course, more doses so that we can distribute them uh, to other countries. That's why we have been asking donors uh, to increase their contribution. And those delays that I've mentioned before, they have been partially compensated by dose sharing. So, for instance, the United States has been very generous. So, uh, sharing doses that uh, were not uh, used in the United States with uh, third countries, and very often uh, this distribution is done through COVAX, in most of the cases through COVAX, and so the same is happening, by the way, in Europe with the European Union. So uh, we are seeing also very good examples of solidarity, uh, and that's a way of uh, having enough doses to distribute to the developing mm. world. Well, your, your organization's original goal, Professor, was that COVAX would deliver 2 billion doses by the end of this year. I was looking on Gavi's website earlier. It's, I think, 563 million doses so far. There's a very good chance you'll end up at less than half of the original goal by the end of this year. We've heard from you today and Gavi and others have said that there have been these external factors, the supply constraints and so on that hindered the goal. But what are the internal factors for improvement? What, what should COVAX do inside under its own control to better be prepared for the next challenge? So, first of all, the last figures I have are 586 million doses already shipped, uh, ordered 764 million doses, and allocated 1.4 billion doses. So, uh, and most of those doses going to countries that without COVAX will not receive them because they will not be able to get them 
in the market. Let's be fair about this. So, but yes, so it's uh, under the initial objective, as I've told you, for those uh, factors, most of them out of the control of COVAX. Uh, anyhow, I think, and you are right in your question, uh, that uh, we also can look at what we can do better in COVAX. I believe uh, uh, what we can do is to streamline the process, to have a better coordination between agencies. Uh, this is possible, and this is precisely what we are now trying to, to achieve, to have uh, more clear responsibilities, to have a better coordination. And I'm happy to tell you that I see that spirit among the different agencies that are working with this uh, very important issue. Did COVAX itself make any mistakes? Was it too ambitious in its statements earlier? I mean, looking retrospectively, probably yes, it was too ambitious uh, or probably a little bit naive because uh, we were thinking that uh, everybody will play multilateral. Uh, in fact, I'm speaking with complete independence. I was not here when those decisions were taken. I, I'm chair of Gavi only since the 1st of January this year. So these decisions were taken before. So I'm speaking with complete independence. Uh, but I think what happened, and that probably was not taken in consideration in the initial design of the uh, scheme of the, this facility, was that the richer countries would be outbidding COVAX, that COVAX would be pushed down the line because manufacturers, of course, M many of them, they gave preferential treatment to those who were putting more money. And in fact, when some countries have stockpiled four or five times more vaccines than the, the ones they needed, of course, that had an impact. So that's why I insist in the need of transparency. So probably in initial design, there was here an um, uh, idealistic view. Another problem was, let's be frank and open about it, the terrible pandemic in India, because India was the biggest producer of vaccines in the world. It's a powerhouse for vaccine production. But when the pandemic attained such a huge dimension, tragic dimension in India, the government of India focused, of course, the vaccines produced there in their own, for their own population. And so, and we did not receive the supplies that were already negotiated by, by COVAX. So that explains big, big, most of the delay was due to that, to that factor. Yes. Yeah, so one. So, so next time, less, next time more, more diversity. And who you, next time, professor, more diversity than just relying on India. Other, exactly, is that a learning exactly. from, from the past year? That, that's one of the learnings, uh, the lessons to be learned, no doubts about it. And by the way, that's why Africans are rightly, from my point of view, insisting also in diversif the diversification of manufacturing for the future. And there, there are already some initiatives going on, but uh, they will not solve the problem for this pandemic, but for the future, yes. Or as the European Union already announced 1 billion euros you know, just to prepare some of this transfer of technology, uh, including uh, uh, on the uh, BioNTech. BioNTech is the, the, the origin of the so-called Pfizer vaccine. It's Pfizer-BioNTech. And there, the Africans themselves, African Union, they created a facility for, for this uh, manufacturing capabilities. Yes, I believe uh, that uh, we should do more to support global diversification um, uh, all over the world. Uh, we need that. So uh, it's, it's a basic, uh, let's say, uh, lesson from prudence, in terms of prudence uh, for resilience, increased resilience. You, you've mentioned the Africa Union. There have been several regional or uh, alliances that have been set up, the Africa Union, Pan American Health Organization, have set up their own efforts to acquire vaccine. Now, Gavi has said that these efforts are complementary to COVAX, but others say they're duplicative or, or redundant, given what COVAX is doing, that essentially it's competing almost. What would you say, Professor? I, I don't think they are competing. I, I don't think COVAX can vaccinate all the world. So uh, we have countries that are making uh, bilateral donations. Uh, we have COVAX. COVAX is the only truly global multilateral system. So it's the only one uh, that uh, tries to address all the world. So we have 190 countries as members. We have distributed uh, the vaccines to 144 countries or economies. Some of them are not full independent countries, but okay, 144 different jurisdictions we have distributed 
uh, vaccine. So we are a truly global, the only truly global um, um, multilateral mechanism. But there are other regional mechanisms, of course, and they are important and uh, everything they can do to, uh, to increase uh, the level of vaccination, we can only welcome. And that is the spirit. In, right. And also, also what governments can do at national level. One last COVAX question. You teach at several universities. That's why I keep referring to you as professor. What grade, what grade would you give COVAX's performance? Um, I'm used to the zero to 20. I will give uh, 14 to 15. So in America, so that would probably be a... Uh, it will be probably a B, you know, in America, B plus. So not perfect, but uh, I mean, let's, let's, I, I'm, you know, I'm new in this field. I, I'm trying to speak, I'm not speaking here just uh, to, 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 to defend my turf. I really believe that the people that are in the front line of this are they doing a great job. All the agencies, Gavi, also the World Health Organization, uh, UNICEF. I mean, they are really doing their best. I have no doubts about it. Uh, but the problem is that this is unprecedented. We never had a pandemic of this kind because it's very globalized. It's truly global. Uh, so uh, there was never in history a global logistic effort of distribution of vaccines as we are seeing today. We already had several epidemics and even pandemics, but for instance, in Asia, or we had Ebola, but they were more or less localized. This is the first a global, really global pandemic with this dimension. And so it's unprecedented in terms of the challenges it puts also from a logistical point of view. It's not just manufacturing of vaccines, it's distribution, it's indemnification liability. Are the logistical conditions in the countries, the recipient countries, is the problem of vaccine hesitancy. So there are many, many issues that are beyond the control of any any international organization. So I don't think we should put the blame on those who are trying to do their best. On the contrary, I think we should welcome their efforts and congratulate them for their efforts. And I think this multilateral effort, in fact, um, deserves to be mm. followed for the future. We should have uh, this ready for future pandemics, because what all scientists say that there will be future pandemics, and what we have now to do is to be better prepared next time, better prepared in terms of funding, so that uh, the multilateral institutions do not go uh, behind the richer countries, but also better prepared logistically as a whole, and also with increased resilience in our systems. I should say as a former student who got more than a few 14s out of 20s, those are usually C grades in the States. We have time for one last question. Uh, so maybe in the final minute, Professor, we are dealing now with this new variant, Omicron, and the need to warn folks around the world and message across different cultures. You have been on the global stage for years. So in the final minute, what is the messaging strategy that you think is necessary to get across all cultures with the new variant? A global cooperation, transparency. By the way, I think we should praise the South Africans because they, as soon as they knew it, they made it public. Uh, so they feel now they are treated unfairly because they made it public. So transparency and global cooperation. This is the kind of battle that we don't uh, win by posturing or with we military weapons. We gain it with science. We gain it with truly multilateral cooperation. The idea that there are common public goods and on common public goods, all countries of the world, in spite of their political regimes or ideologies, should cooperate sincerely. Well, we are out of time, so we'll have to leave it there. Jose Manuel Barroso, thank you again for joining this conversation. I appreciated the opportunity to hear directly from you. If I ever have a term paper, I hope you will grade it. Thanks again. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for tuning in to this conversation. If you'd like to check out the other conversations we have on tap, head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and to find out more information about those upcoming programs. I'm Dan Diamond. As always, thank you so much for watching.